Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nettling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to bring your business and your life to the next level. I have today with me Mike Kading, and let me tell you a little bit about Mike. Mike is the CEO of Norhart, the design, build, and rent apartments. They are transforming the way this is done by incorporating technologies and techniques that have revolutionized other industries. This has resulted in improved quality, reduced cost of housing. And ultimately they are committed to solving America's housing shortage and affordability crisis. And in doing that, they hope to improve the way we all live. So please join me in welcoming Mike Kading as my guest. Mike? Hi, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, You know, I live in Atlanta where we have a diverse group of people and used to spend uh, time in California, um, visit a Vancouver, uh, and just any large city, especially that you go, you see housing as an issue. Um, So the theme today is going to be the one thing that every real estate expert gets wrong and anxious to hear what your advice towards that is. But as we always do, the early first question is always an easy one. Tell everyone where you live. Yeah, I live here in Minnesota. Uh, I've got two beautiful kids. One's three-year-olds old and five-year-old. Uh, and there's so much fun. Every Saturday morning, uh, my older daughter wakes me up really early so that we can play Mario together up on the couch, but a beautiful area that we're in. Yeah. Lots of snow coming your way, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, and I have a four and an eight-year-old grandson, so I can really um, appreciate the the age that you have right now, they are so much fun. And both those kids are into Mario. <laughs> so. <laughs> Love it. All right. So shall, share the story. You know, you didn't start out um, where you are right now. So t- share the story about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, ultimately, this was a family business. My parents started the business when I was quite young. In fact, we lost everything. And my dad was even kidnapped in Peru. Crazy story. But as we grew up, I was on site helping, maybe not the greatest help, but uh, swinging a hammer, picking up nails or sweeping stuff up. Uh, I was probably more of a nuisance than anything, but I was learning. I was part of that process. And we were building these small apartment buildings. But then I went off to college. And in college, I wanted nothing to do with the family business. And the reason that was is that I didn't want people to think it was given to me. So I really wrestled with my own ego. But what I realized deep down is that I wanted to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact in the world. And I could do this by taking this small business and growing it to the point that we could have that impact by ultimately uh, driving down the cost of construction. So I joined my dad and we uh, doubled the size of the company in a few years we worked together. But then one day my dad unexpectedly passed away. Um, so overnight I became the CEO of this organization and it was hard. It was a really rough path, but looking back, there was almost some magic in it. Mm -hmm. I try to look at the positive of everything. And I think the positive was this. I didn't know much. 
right? I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I, we could start experimenting. We just tried new things and doing things differently. And we did a lot of that. There was a lot of pain involved, but that was the start in really driving down the costs of construction, which is what we can think, which I think is the key element to helping us mm -hmm. solve housing affordability. Yeah. And I loved the, that you, it, it's a great example of the fact that people around us teach us things without teaching us things, if you will. So just by your hanging around doing small jobs, you were learning the business, even if you yeah. may have been resisting of it as you got older, which happens oftentimes. But I love that you were able to come back and work with your family business. And my question is, when you first started to talk to your father about perhaps a different way to do things, what was his reaction? You know, he was he was actually pretty supportive of me. I will say there were hard times where he, I think he knew something was the wrong way to do things and he would push back in those situations, which was good for me. But being a young pipsqueak kid, it was hard <laughs> hearing no and being pushed back on. And there were honestly probably some ideas and things that we had at that time that would have been better, but, you know, the older you get, the more you get to kind of stuck in your ways because this is the way that's worked. Mm, and that's so. the kind of thinking I think that's made this industry, industry so stuck for so many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think too, whenever you're, you venture into this having affordable housing and apartments, it, uh, there's that idea, well, I don't want to be the landlord or I don't want to be that that person that's got that low income kind of home and the quality maybe not there so how did you manage to add the techniques and take advantage of maybe the technology to ensure that even though the cost was lower the quality was still there for the the consumer yeah that's a great question because if you look at our properties, actually, some of them are the nicest in the state, mm -hmm. right? We have thousands of square feet of amenities, restaurant, coffee shop, co-working space, rooftop, patio, and grill pools, views of downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul, sometimes seven-story buildings with three stories of parking garage, right? So these are not, uh, quote-unquote, like cheap properties. Yeah. But the interesting thing is if you look at the last 60 years, Industries like manufacturing have improved labor productivity by 760%. Wow. Construction during that time period has done nothing. It's remained flat. And so if you look at your iPhone, no one probably can disagree with the fact that that is a better product than the original cell phones we had you know, oh, 30 absolutely. years ago. Oh, and they're absolutely. actually less expensive today if you adjust for inflation than those original phones. And so when people say there's a, a, you either get quality or low cost, that's fundamentally a fallacy if you think about the problem in the right way. Mm -hmm. Now, our industry in the world of construction has been stuck in the old way of thinking. There's been almost no improvement. So at a simple level, what we did is we looked at these other industries and asked, what are they doing differently that we can then apply to our own world? And so we started doing that. One of the key differences that we made early on is we brought all of the construction work under one roof. Mm -hmm. In the world of construction, typically you have mm -hmm. a different company that's your electrician, a different company that's your plumber, a different company that's your general contractor. You know, if a construction company were to produce cars, you'd have a different company installing the windshield, a different company installing the door, and a different company installing the tire. And of course, the tire company, they would call you up and say, hey, I'm so sorry. I got delayed on another project. I can't get out there for two weeks. So your line would be completely shut down. See, the world of manufacturing looks at us and says, you guys are crazy. And we respond with, well, this is the way it's always been done. Mm -hmm. So it's not good. So we brought all the work under one roof. And that alone, we saw cost improvements because of the profit margins on subcontractors, we were able to pull that back. But then the next thing is we could then apply 
some very simple techniques like the assembly line. Mm -hmm. Nothing revolutionary, but it improved manufacturing substantially. And so what we do, well, if you think about it, you can't take a building and drive it down a line. No, but what you can do is you can take the person and move them through the building. So what we do is about every five hours, each team shifts through the building by one unit. So if you look at the end of our building, every five hours, we have a brand new apartment unit completed. And that mm. one technique might take a project that takes 15 months and drives it down to nine. So there are lots mm. of little techniques like that, 10,000 techniques we say, mm. but you bring it all together and then you start having meaningful impact on costs. I know um, in my prior career, I worked for Arby's corporate office and I was a construction coordinator at that time. And it was around the time where our head of construction decided to not build on property and to, and we went actually, I think to Minneapolis or in that area of Minnesota um, to a company that would build the walls and then we would ship the walls and, um, and in, as you said, it cut the time that it put up, took us to put up a building in half. And it, it was high quality because there wasn't weather impacts. Um, people weren't stealing our stuff from the site, <laughs> you know, all those things. So I could see the, the brilliance in what you're doing, everything in-house. What about the things you can't control with COVID, especially I, I was on a large project um, in 21 where the um, supply chain just kind of messed us up every which way in Sunday. So how can you control your deliverable when you have, you still have to have lumber and all the other things that are not in your control? Yeah, I'll give you two answers. One is sort of a, a high-level answer, and then I'll give you a specific answer to that question. The high-level thing is that you have to realize that there's always going to be problems. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of it. Whenever you're trying to do something new, there's going to be issues that come into play. And so what you need to do from a strategic level is build up the capacity in your team to be nimble and solve problems quickly. And the key thing behind that is to hire the very best people. I could talk all day about that topic. Yeah. So that's the high level thing. But the specific thing, how do we handle COVID? So we, yeah, we had the same problems that hit us in the face. We were, we weren't able to get materials when we needed to, like resin was a big issue. We saw lumber prices go up by tenfold. And so all, some of it was, we just got hit with the pain of it, but we looked at this and said, how do we do this differently? we said, why not build out the supply chain capacity within our company? Because mm -hmm. a lot of what was happening is that um, certain allocations of resources were going to some people and not others, intended to be people with better relationships, things of that nature. So if we could bypass all of that and have direct relationships with manufacturers, have a, uh, a transportation infrastructure that's strongly in place, then as these things hit, we could better control what mm. went on. And so that's what we did. And on top of that, not only better controlling it, we're saving substantial costs because mm. now we're going directly to manufacturers in China mm. and Mexico and here in the United States to supply those materials for us. And we no longer have the supplier middleman that was allocating resources to us in a way that was unfavorable. Yeah, and it also helps you better control the costs when you eliminate the middleman. Exactly. So you talked about hiring and, you know, I, I think that that's sometimes the downfall of any company is how they, they hire it and the culture that they build. So talk about having that great culture that when you get the good people, you, first of all, have them that they want to stay because of the culture, but also the culture encourages them to grow within your organization. Yeah. So whenever we talk culture, uh, the number one thing you can do to build a great culture is to hire the right people. And so I'll talk first about that. And I'll mention some cultural things we do beyond that. 
But when we talk about hiring the right people, the very best, I truly mean that. Like we, uh, we have employees that we fly in from other states to come work during the week and then fly them home on the weekend because they're the best in the country at what they do. Mm. We have one employee that in 2007, Steve Jobs announces the iPhone. Steve Jobs walks off stage and our employee walks on that same stage following that iconic Steve Jobs announcement, right? It's that kind of caliber of people. And the magic is they change things. They mm. make things possible for you that you didn't even know could happen. <laughs> and so bring in those great people. But oftentimes business leaders at this point stop me and say, Mike, that sounds expensive. <laughs> the reality is it is. If you look at it at, at a cost per person basis, it is expensive. But what most people fail to understand is that the best people outperform the average by two to five to 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. And so instead of looking at it as a cost per person, look at it from a cost per unit produced. And from that perspective, the best people are actually your least expensive. Mm -hmm. So when people say, I can't afford to hire the best, my response is simply, you can't afford not to. Mm -hmm. So that's the foundation. You have to get that right. Once you've got that foundation right, you need to start thinking about the culture. So part of that hiring process is recognizing that you're not always going to be great at picking out the best people. In fact, my experience, even though we've got this a very elaborate multi-step process, I feel like we're only good to a level of about 50%. And so we recognize that fact and we take actions accordingly. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the big ones we do is that for most positions in our company, and we're very upfront with this, that you come in with a two week trial period. Oh, so you have two idea. weeks, so you'll be paid for that time. But at the end of the two weeks, your coworkers decide whether or not mm -hmm. you stay within the organization. And so that has been a really key aspect to this. Another part of it is just building out the capacity to find great people. We ended up hiring on an entire recruiting team, much mm -hmm. larger than most organizations because we knew we needed to go out and proactively find the kind of people we want in mm -hmm. our company. But another piece of it is as a leader, you need to know what you stand for. Mm -hmm. And this can be, you know, traditionally good things. It could be something different. Maybe what you stand for is that you just work incredibly hard and like, that's the kind of organization you want. There's nothing wrong with that. What's important is to understand who you are. And then create a list of values, purpose, a mission, and values that are consistent with that. Don't create mm -hmm. values that are what you think sound nice, but are not consistent with who you are. <laughs> and then what you want to do is you want to hire and fire according to those values. Um, it's so simple, but it's so critical to get right. So I could go on more, but those are some tips that we yeah. use. Excellent advice. And and really just to kind of piggyback on the comment of the cost, we all know that if I hire people that aren't of the caliber I need, then I have to get rid of them. And now I have the cost of orientation and all of that. It's so much more expensive to replace somebody than it is to hire someone good. Absolutely. And then you also have this weird... I've seen this so many times where managers will have someone that's not great. They're not horrible. But they're not great. They're not helping. They're just kind of there. And then the manager is like, oh, I've got to go through that whole hiring process again. And they're just slow to let someone go that they know they should. And that is another hidden cost to all of this mm. to hiring the wrong person. Yeah. So let's get into this question though of, um, you know, what what is the real estate experts? What are they getting wrong? I'll give two different answers to this. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the biggest one is maybe less actionable, and the second one is more actionable for people. But I think the biggest one is simply that our cost of construction is out of whack, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to work as an industry to solve that. This is why. Housing costs have gone so high. If our construction costs were half, that'd make a huge impact. And for us right now, 
we're already achieving about a 20 to 30% reduction in those construction costs. And we believe that eventually we can get to a 50% reduction. But imagine what that means. It means someday your rent or your mortgage payment could be half. And these are things that are actually obtainable. We're doing it right now, right? And you too, as a real estate professional, could be having similar kinds of impact. So I think that that's the big one. But I'd say the second one that I think people would disagree with me on this, but this is how I feel. I, feel. I think so many people, I shouldn't say so many, there's a, there's, there's a chunk of the group of people in real estate that want passive income, living on a beach, just relaxing, drinking a martini. And I think if your dream is to get into real estate, to live this sort of easy, carefree life, Yes, it can happen for some people, but that's not really the reality of it. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started, I brought my first uh, rental property at age 20. Um, it was anything but passive. <laughs> I remember oh, it was just a, just a house, but I was the one out there trying to get renters in the unit. I went and did all the turnovers. I remember on Thanksgiving weekend, we had a resident move out that I had to evict. The house was a disaster. And here I was working through the night, multiple days in a row, not seeing my family because I knew that I had to get this unit back up onto the market. Otherwise, I couldn't afford to pay the mortgage payment that was in that house. And even when uh, things were going along better, I suppose, you're still always worried because, oh, the rent check didn't come in when it needed to. It's a few days late. Oh, now, now you're thinking about it. Now you're having to call them, having to pressure them to, to pay that rent pat back in. It... It's work. There's real work in this industry. Uh, there is no real free lunch in life. And so <laughs> that I think is a common misconception, at least for people thinking that they want to jump into this industry. Yeah. And I, I know um, several of the people that I've interviewed, they talk about, you know, you hire people to be the property manager and all that, but you really like anything in your business, you being an absentee owner does not usually bode well. <laughs> well, yeah. And on top of that, you hire all these other people to do the work for you, but then your profit disappears. Mm -hmm. Right. And even then the property manager that you hire, it's a, they're not always the greatest, right? You yeah. may actually be leaving money on the table because they're not pushing the property as much as they should be. They're, they want to do less work as well so they can get their fat check and be happy. So they'll do only as much as they need to, to keep you modestly happy. And so just, yeah, it, there is no free lunch. <laughs> so what do you think over this time, you know, from the, the d early days of you being the CEO to where you are now, um, what has been the biggest challenge and what is the best lessons that you've learned? Um, yeah, I think the biggest challenges have been just struggling to be good enough at stuff, right? I remember early on after my dad passed away, uh, we were building a new building called Emberwood and I didn't really know what I was doing in many regards. In fact, the city agreed that I didn't really know what I was doing yet, right? <laughs> I was I, young, I was young. I was a pipsqueak mm -hmm. kid. And in fact, the city shut us down twice. And the second time they shut us down, they, they brought me into their office. It was horrible. One of the worst moments of my life. Yeah. They looked at me and they said, Mike, you're not good enough to do this project. You need to hire someone that can manage what you're doing. And so we were shut down and we found someone to hire, which was the worst way to do it. We hired someone like three days, not a good fit, but behind the scenes, we were doing all the work that we knew we needed to, to get better at what we were doing. Right. And I remember a few weeks before we were supposed to open, there was a water main buried 15 feet in the ground that was a thousand feet long. And somewhere in this water main was a pinhole leak. We could <sighs> see it on the test, but we had no idea where it was. Oh, and so wow. we spent days and nights working round the clock, digging holes, trying to find this leak. It was <laughs> awful. And my excavator wanted to leave the site so bad. And I was out there in my nice clothes shoveling and like just, uh, it was, it was terrible. 
In fact, I remember one night, it was my brother's birthday. And I came home late. It was like nine or 10 o'clock. He said, Mike, can we just eat cake and sing happy birthday? I said, Luke, I don't have it in my, to even do that. And I just went to bed. Mm -hmm. It was terrible, right? And I remember then a few days before we were supposed to open, the city staff said to us, they said, there's no way. You're not opening. And uh, we had families that were going to be moving in and they didn't mm -hmm. have any place to go unless we opened on time. So we worked crazy hours. But I remember, remember the very last day where we had the, half a dozen inspectors come to a half day inspection and they looked at every nook and cranny of that building. And at the end, I remember the head building official pulling me aside in the basement. And he said, Mike, I know we were hard on you. But honestly, looking at this project today, this is the nicest project that we've opened in our city. Yeah. Like, finally, right? Yeah, finally, validation. some validation yeah. that I can do what I'm seeking out to do. But here's the reality, and this is the important lesson, is that we are all terrible at what we start. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we're young, we don't care, right? We don't care. Like, we can't walk. We can't talk. We can't ride a bike. We can't add. But we're okay with that. But there's something that happens to us as we grow older. Where we start to feel like we need to have our stuff together. And so we become afraid to try new things because we know we're going to be terrible at it. But we have a show where I, uh, our own podcast, where I get to meet billionaires on a regular basis. And the thing that really distinguishes those who become billionaires versus those who don't are the ones that become very comfortable in failure comfortable knowing they're not very good and it's in the process of trying that then you become better at what you do mm -hmm. and so the probably one of the best lessons i can give you is be okay with that go yeah. out and try something new and ignore the haters and be okay that you're bad to begin with that is just part of the process yeah it's so true for you know not just in real estate but any any business you know for all of us, we um, we have to push ourselves to outside of our comfort zone as we get good at something. And that means you're going to fail and you're going to falter. But do you get back up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's time now for us to move on to just, I guess, one rapid fire question. And so what is the long-term impact that you hope Norhart will make, you know, leaving your legacy? Huh? Yeah. I mean, the heart of it is that I want to make a meaningful, positive impact in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad died relatively young. And it really reminded me how short life really is. We only live about 5,000 weeks here on earth. And I ask myself almost every day, how do I want to spend the minutes I have here on earth? And for me, it's about making that impact. But the way I believe that we can make it over my lifetime is to solve housing affordability by meaningfully driving down the cost of construction. It's good things. All right. If you would like to connect with Mike and learn more about what he's doing, and um, maybe you are one of those best employees that could sometimes join his team, I'm going to share my screen and you can take a photo of it, a screenshot of it. Or if you're just listening, you know the drill. You should have a paper and pencil already so that you can get the website information I'm giving you right now, which is https colon forward slash forward slash www.norhart.com. That's N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com, www.norhart.com. Facebook, you can find him at Mike Kading. And yeah. that's M-I-K-E-M-I-K-E. K-A-E-D-I-N-G. LinkedIn is my Kading. Instagram is my Kading. YouTube is, is at Norhart, 
with a capital N for Norhart. And Twitter is Mike Kading. And again, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to be able to talk to you just what you can find when you go to the website um, or any of his uh, YouTube uh, so, uh, videos and things that might help you. Yeah, so there are two interesting things we have going on. The first is that we have a number of shows, and one of my favorite is called Zero to Unicorn. It's about the journey of small groups growing to billion-dollar scale. And uh, I'll give you a sense of one of my favorite guests. His name is Michael Usland. He was the executive producer and the originator of the Batman movies. And he was able to squeak by at a young age getting the movie rights to Batman. And he thought it would be easy to then bring that to the studios and get these movies made. But the reality is that everyone slammed the door in his face. Wow. And it took him 10 years of people telling him he wasn't good enough, that he couldn't do this, that his idea of a dark and serious Batman movie was crazy and that he should just give it up. But he didn't. And in the end, he obviously prevailed and now has done incredible things with the Batman franchise, as well as things like the Lego movie and National Treasure, uh, Joker series, and more. And his story is just incredible. But we have guests like that and many others on our series. And then the second thing that we have going on is we're offering up uh, investments. So if you want to be involved in what we're doing from a financial standpoint, uh, you can go to our website and learn about the investments that we have. At a simple level, we're offering up to 8.5% interest for locking in your money between 6 and 24 months. Uh, mm -hmm. They feel a little bit like CDs. They're not. We're not FDIC insured. Um, but they're a great place to put your money and then get a great rate of return from that. Well, Mike, it's been really wonderful chatting with you. I believe that what you're doing is really important um, and hopefully you can make that impact that you desire uh, and uh, maybe you can inspire others to do more so that we can make a larger impact across the world because, you know, you, you can't do it by yourself. It needs to be worldwide kind of people thinking this way, right? So thank you so much for being a great guest. And as always, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nettling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.